It was early morning in the small village as the town market began to open. Her mother had rushed her from bed so that they may make the journey from their farm before the late summer heat took its hold on the Lear region. They gathered the grapes in their baskets and loaded them into the cart before setting off up the path through the green hills in the early red light of dawn. Soon, excitement brightened her weary eyes as they saw the buildings in the distance. She would see her friends in the marketplace and share gossip and stories of all that had passed in the weeks since she had last seen them. There would be young men as well and opportunities to share glances and flirts as they sampled cheeses and other wares from the multitudes of booths and shops. It would be a special week for her and a break in the tedium of her normal mundane farm work and household chores. The grapes were shining in deep crimson in their ripeness. It had been a good year, and there would be extra money to be spent. She had followed her mother to their place in the bazaar, and after erecting the canopy and setting out baskets for passing buyers, she was allowed to wander. She had only just found her friends as they gathered at the well, filling clay jugs and skins when they saw the woman come staggering up the road. She was clothed only in a thin, faded blue tunic, which hung from her bony frame, as if caught there by accident as it blew by in the wind. Her hair was long and light-colored, bleached almost white by days of exposure to the sun. Her skin, although tan, held a ghostly, cadaverous shade beneath her long, unkempt hair. She walked in a slow stagger on her small, bare, unsteady feet, making her way towards them. The girls huddled slightly closer and were relieved when the woman's passage was interrupted by the presence of four young men from the town. The woman was obviously a foreigner, and her presence had not gone unnoticed. The boys stood before her as she swayed from side to side, as if on the verge of collapse. The boys were laughing as they questioned her, but she only stared at them with hollow, dark eyes, which seemed to see through them as if they were transparent as glass. Water, she said, with a strange accent, which they immediately began to mock. The boys had begun making rude suggestions, and one had even reached out and tugged at her hair as he compared it to the dry straw. I am so thirsty, she mumbled, as she fell forward and was caught by one especially arrogant adolescent. Please, just give me a drink, she said, as he pushed her to the road and laughed. One of the boys' fathers had noticed the spectacle and was hurriedly making his way through the crowd when the small group of girls saw more strangers approaching. A long procession had appeared on the road from the direction where the first woman had come. Their numbers seemed to be ever increasing, and the townspeople moved closer to watch with wonder as the group began to file into the square. All were women of various ages and color, accompanied by wild beasts, which walked amongst them like tamed pets. The girls saw a pair of tigers walking side by side with three wolves who stared hungrily at the townspeople. Ravens and hawks rode upon their shoulders as goats and cattle strolled behind them free of yoke or rein. The woman who stood at the head of this procession was tall and pale of skin with long black hair that hung down over her shoulders like a dark shimmering cloak. She walked directly to where the boy stood and hovered before them, a fearsome apparition. The morning breeze blowing her tunic loosely over small white breasts which bore long jagged red wounds. The father had made his way to the front of the crowd and ran forward in a panic as he grabbed his son and pushed him roughly behind him. He shoved at the others and stood with his hands clasped, pleading, Please! They do not know! He said as if on the verge of weeping. Who are they? The girl whispered to Eliana, eldest of her friends, as they watched the display with growing uncertainty. They are Bacchae. Come down from the mountains for the Bacchanalia at Aventine, she whispered back. I believe that woman the boys assaulted was one of their own. They did not know. The tall woman said quietly to the man, as if she were dreaming. They did not know, she repeated, as if tasting the words. Licking her dry, cracked lips as she spoke, 
The entire town square had grown silent, as if none dared even draw the breath. The woman's eyes suddenly grew fierce and seemed to change shades from black into some dimly glowing lavender. As she shouted, THEY DID NOT KNOW! The girl saw that several of the other women carried drums, and now had begun a slow, steady beat as the animals with them became restless and paced in circles. The woman turned to the crowd and stared at them all accusingly. The air had grown hot with a strange energy, as if a storm were preparing to unleash a bolt of lightning from the clouds. The woman's expression was distorted and deranged as she lunged at the father of the boy and clawed at his face like a maddened animal. He fell to the ground weeping as she stood over him, seething with rage. He will know, she hissed, and her words dripped with poison as she stared down at him with wild, unbridled hatred. Then slowly, she stood tall and began to move back as several of the other women collected the fallen one from the ground. She cast one more disgusted glance at the town as the entire throng began to retreat back onto the road and leave. The girl's mother now rushed to her side as the entire market fell into confusion and chaos. The girl, Fabricia, looked at her mother who was listening as one of the boy's mothers, who had not dared to step forward, fell weeping to the ground. They will come for them. They will come for them, and we will all be cursed. Mother, I, I don't understand, Fabricia said as she pulled at her mother's tunic. What, what were those women? They are the followers of the God of the Vine, members of the mysteries of Bacchus. We must act quickly, Fabricia, so that at least maybe we will be spared their wrath. Fabricia's mother quickly began speaking with the mothers of her friends as they hastily formulated a plan. Quickly selling and trading, they bought the most delicious of foods and the finest of the market wines and filled a cart. Then taking Fabricia and the two of her friends from town, the sisters, Eliana and Juliana, they were thrust aboard the cart in a frantic rush as the noonday sun began its descent. You must follow their path to where they are resting. You will most likely find them in the valley near the Tiber River. But why must we go? Why can you not go to them? They will not harm you. Give them everything that we have collected and tell them the names of your families and beg them for forgiveness. Give them no insult and do not waste your breath begging for the lives of the boys. Their behavior has sealed their fate. But mother, what will they do to them? It doesn't matter. We must protect ourselves. Show them the greatest respect and do exactly as I have told you. They should accept you as guests among them. Listen to everything they tell you as if it were your lives which are depending on their courtesy. With that, she kissed Fabricia on her brow and sent the cart rolling down the road in the direction taken by the procession. What have we done? Julia, the sister's mother, said with horror, tears running from her eyes. If all goes well, they will be fine and return to us, Fabricia's mother answered as she fought back tears of her own. If we do nothing, then there is no question of the nightmare which will come to our doorstep. As Fabricia's mother had foretold, the Bacchae rested in a lovely valley by the river. Many lay curled and slumbering after bathing in the waters of the Tiber beneath the twisted limbs of the olive trees which grew in a sparse forest along the bank. They said nothing and did not even rise from their rest when they saw the cart approaching from the winding path. The women stared at the girls with the same dreamy tranquility that had been in their eyes before events in the town had set them astir. Fabricia saw the tall dark woman who had clawed at the man's face, and climbing from her seat approached with timid respect as she knelt before her where she sat clothed in a violet robe. In the grass as another woman brushed her long, wet hair. Fabricia glanced up only for a moment at the scratches and cuts which adorned the woman's pale flesh beneath the purple garment. We've brought you gifts from our families, Fabricia said quietly, to beg for your forgiveness. We have come with the utmost respect for the god of the vine. Fabricia waited as the woman's dull and sunken eyes fell over her. Eliana and Julia, who were older and stronger, were carrying jugs of wine to the woman, who looked up from where they lay beside wolves, leopards, and tigers with sudden dawning interest. 
Say his name, the woman said suddenly. Fabricia looked up, surprised, but soon realizing what she was being asked, said, Bacchus. He is Bacchus. He who dies and is reborn. She was speaking as if from within the limbo of some bottomless sleep. He shows us the truth of ourselves. Do you know the truth of yourself? Fabricia struggled within her thoughts for some answer. No, I don't think I do. When all that you think that you are has been destroyed, then what is left is the truth. But I don't want anything to be destroyed, she said suddenly, fearful that the woman was threatening her. Then the truth of yourself is fear. The fear of destruction. When that fear is gone, then you will find another, deeper truth. The woman turned her gaze away to the hills of the surrounding valley as the sun was vanishing in a cascade of orange and fiery red twilight. Fabricia had not realized that music had begun around her. The drums were slowly beating again as many of the women, after consuming several bowls of the town wine, began to play on flutes and lyres. You will drink the woman said, as Fabricia was offered a clay bowl with a potent dark red wine. And you will dance with us. Fabricia almost said that she did not know the dance of which they were speaking, but remembering her mother's words, remained silent. A gentle cool breeze blew over them as she began to sip from the bowl and deep warmth spread out from her chest to the very tips of her fingers and toes. As the night fell, a storm began to emerge from over the hilltops and lightning flashes cool and cutting across the night sky. After a time, several of the women began to dance to the beat of the drums and the singing of the flutes. At first, their movements were slow and matched the sway of the tree limbs as they moved effortlessly in a lovely but somehow terrifying exhibition. As the wine began to take its effect on the girls, they joined in the dance as they had been told to do. As rain broke from the heavens and began to fall over them, Fabricia and the whirling sisters laughed as the movement of the women became erratic. They would lash out as if wrestling with unseen forces as their hair flailed with pounding of the drums. After a time, Fabricia thought that she could see shapes moving behind the trees, dark, contorted shadows that one moment were there and then were gone in an instant. The last thing she remembered was the vision of a tall figure which seemed to emerge from the darkness near the river. In the light of a single great burst of pale white fire from the sky, she thought for a moment she could discern the outline of a young man who stood clothed only in a long open robe which flowed over him in a shroud of burgundy. He came walking towards the ever more chaotic and lurid dancing, carrying a staff in one hand while the other rested on the mane of a lion. After that, Fabricia's mind seemed to plunge into darkness. The three girls awakened alone in the valley. It was mid-morning, and all that remained to attest to what had occurred the previous day was their now empty cart. They rose stiffly and examined their torn and soaked garments with wonder as they walked ill and exhausted to begin their return to town. Fabricia stared at her fingers and saw that several of her nails were loose and bleeding, as if they had been torn from the bone. She belched awful acidic bile and vomited twice on the road as they returned. She had looked upon her sick and saw the deep crimson color thinking the wine was so red that it looks like blood as I spit it out. Returning home, they were told that a great calamity had fallen. The families of the boys who had stood mocking the Bacchae women in the town square. Their vineyards and crops had been torn and leveled by terrible winds and pounding rains. The boys had disappeared in the night during the horrible thunderstorm which had come so unexpectedly and laid the houses of their families in ruin. The next time that Fabricia walked with her mother at the bazaar, she passed the father of the boy who had pushed the Bacchae down. The marks of the attack now scars across his cheek and throat. When he saw Fabricia, he suddenly fell into a fit of shaking and weeping as he backed away into the crowd. Fabricia had looked across the square where Eliana and Julia stood quiet and alone. The girls shared glances as their thoughts wandered together to the dance and the storm which they could no longer remember. 
The months pass in a blur of typical work and life at the farm. The coiled underneath was a serpent of doubt, which was striking and biting at the lives of the three girls. Their families had become anathema at the market, and the business waned as they were forced further down the road to sell the bounty of their harvests. Still, the poison quickened, and even as far as Rome, the tales had spread of the girls who had gone to the Bacchae and the sons who had been lost. Fabricia's dreams were haunted by visions of running free and mad in the cold embrace of a violent storm. She saw herself as she ran through the hills, as fast as fury, accompanied by strange men whose brows were crowned by long curling horns, their smiles savage and depraved as they sang and played songs on the pipes of pain. Always the dreams would lead her to a ravine which overlooked a small farmhouse nestled in a grove of cultivated olive. The rain poured down as she saw the forms of the women writhing in ecstasy at the beat of the drums and the crash of the thunder. She watched as a tree was blown down onto the house and its occupants came scurrying into the open light and always there was the boy. As the people ran in panic to soothe the animals of the farm, the boy wandered out to the trees where he heard music playing and women laughing. Always in the dream he wandered too far. Fabricia watched as they fell upon him and dragged him away with his screams muffled by the wind and rain. In these dreams, Fabricia watched as if apart from herself. She could see her own slender form amongst the Bacchae as they tore first at his clothes and then at his flesh. The father of the boy had noticed his son's absence and came running through the field calling out his name. It was he who burst through the bushes and looked on in horror at the sight of the demented feast which was playing out before him. Fabricia could see the agony and terror in the wide, frightened eyes which looked out from above the jagged wounds across his face. She could see the guilt and resignation as he turned and ran back to the rest of his family. On this night, as on many others, Fabricia awakened weeping as she gazed around the shadows of her room. Her parents slipped soundly as she arose and walked as if bidden into the cool night air. There was no storm but only the chill pale moon would look down, full and hypnotic from the sky above the distant pasture. She walked out into the field and saw the shapes which stirred in the darkness like moving liquid pitch. As if rising from the ground was the tall specter of the Baca, standing calm and beckoning, the figures of Eliana and Julia at her side like thin ghosts of wayward children. On the hill, standing in the lunar glow, was the figure of the man waiting in the distance. The Bacchae held out her hand and gestured for her to follow. Fabricia approached and took Eliana's and Julia's hands as they followed up the hill towards the robed figure, which waited silent and smiling with eyes like clear, shining amethyst.